Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as Bonjour the Anti-Racism and Equity Moi, Lead Staff at the National Adele Office Halliday. of the United Church of Canada. And et je suis responsable de la lutte contre le racisme et l'équité dans Je suis très heureuse de savoir ce que vous avez vu. C'est donc la um, première journée pour lancer notre session de 40 jours. And uh, so we would invite you to enable interpretation bilingue. on your screen um, because the presentation will be in both English and French. Uh, to enable interpretation, interpretation, if you could please hover over the on your Alors, pour um, pouvoir screen, it will look like vous a globe, servir, uh, and then you can choose the language that you would prefer, either uh, English or French. La langue de votre choix. So for tonight, Uh, we will Donc, be pour ce soon soir, engaging in a conversation about the dual function of genealogy and family lore uh, in cases of race shifting, and we will introduce our la, presenter uh, in a moment. But first, just a few um, background, a few pieces of background. Et donc, uh, this gathering is part of the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, uh, and this series for 2023 began today. Uh, today, the first written reflections are online, and this is the first of the 40 Days live series that will be running on Tuesdays uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. This gathering is also recorded, so um, the video will also be available after afterwards for sharing et in both English and Donc, French. Euh, si vous le souhaitez, vous Today is a conversation about land and identity and treaty. And so in many ways, we'll be acknowledging euh, the land uh, by engaging in this conversation today. So thank you once again for being here. Terre, de, de, du territoire. For the 40 days, in addition to the live events, there are also a Alors, series of study groups uh, plus, that will begin uh, next week. Des, ces, These study groups are also offered in English and French, and you can études, sign up for them as well on the uh, Church X website. En en uh, like the four rest of the 40 days series, there's no charge to attend, um, and they're offered de, on different days on as well as different time zones. Piquet. Et euh, tout ça, c'est pour accommoder tout le monde, mais aussi dans toutes les zones euh, horaires. Um, Il y a week, également uh, there's, there's several, des livres uh, que nous souhaitons euh, recommander cette by semaine, the author. comme vous comprenez, uh, c'est écrit book is par l'auteur qui est Dr. Le... And um, his book, Distorted Identity, White Claims to, um, uh, distor sorry, Distorted Descent, White Claims to Indigenous Distorted Identity. Descent, white claims It is available from the United Church Bookstore, and if you use the code 40 days, you can receive a discount of 20% off for orders of two or more books. This book is also available in French. In French. Dans le cadre de ça. Uh, Ce livre-là um, a été traduit d'ailleurs déjà en français. À la fin de uh, cette so rencontre, il y aura you click un leave, sondage um, et uh, avant que vous ne quittiez, on va vous demander d'avoir la gentillesse et remplir ce sondage. C'est uniquement quatre questions. So with that, I would like Alors, to introduce my ceci, colleague Springwater, ça, who uh, works in the Indigenous Ministries and Justice Unit at the uh, National Office, and she will guide us through the rest dans, of the evening. She will be a moder our moderator and justice, also uh, guiding the questions. So over to you, Springwater, and elle thanks, va, uh, vous présenter notre Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir. Um, My name is Springwater Hester Mwaske, and I am the uh, Springwater uh, Hester Coordinator of Indigenous Ministries of Justice at My father uh, originally comes from uh, Wiskaganish First Nation, which is northern suis, James Bay, uh, Quebec, and my mother is originally from uh, Serpent River First Nation. Des, 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 I grew up in northern des, Ontario and attended a predominantly uh, white Catholic school. Back then, no one was looking to be Indigenous or Métis. We were often looked down on and mocked when we made purchases using our status cards at the mall. We were often called out for our supposed free education and all the other supposed perks that came with our free rights. A few years ago, I read Daryl Rue's book and I was completely in awe of the depth of the research. Daryl's book was able to lay out facts for me that were better equipped to speak to Indigenous identity facts. In the last 10 years or so, we've seen more and more people claiming to be Indigenous. Uh, et, I have heard some Indigenous people call this 
par la profondeur de ses recherches, le livre de Derry m'a permis d'exposer des faits qui m'ont permis de mieux parler de le surpasser de l'identité autochtone. Depuis une dizaine d'années, nous voyons de plus en plus des personnes cette prétendre autochtone. J'ai entendu Char certains uh, autochtones qualifier ces phénomènes de nouvelles vagues par le ministre en mai réparant tout ce soir. J'ai entendu, entendu une entrevue, celle de David Chakra, de la Fédération des métiers du Manitoba. Il a raconté comment les métiers ont mis leur rapport en 1916 lors de leur victoire à Fort Plain et comment le Comité national des métiers a été consolidé en tant que gouvernement provincial de Manitoba. 1969, Ariel, à sa tête. M. Chartrain a parlé du fait que les métiers avaient leur propre langle et qu'on les appelait le peuple de perles de fleurs. Et toutes ces choses différentes dont Chartrain a parlé montrent un continuum d'un autre. Aujourd'hui, nous assistons à une nouvelle vague de métiers qui s'identifie comme telle et prétend qu'ils sont métiers parce qu'ils se prétendent des sangrilés. Et en regardant tout ça, nous constatons qu'il y a une augmentation de ces gens de cas. Alors, il y a euh, beaucoup, euh, nous avons constaté la flûte de la révision constitutionnelle. Euh, et justement, euh, le docteur Leroux euh, va nous parler de ce livre, nous voyons. Il va nous parler de comment les gens essaient de euh, utiliser l'autochtonie euh, avec une fédération. Dans la Fédération des Matiwa, des collègues, il a présenté aussi sa parole des étudiants et d'un endroit des écoles où il s'est délu de travail. Alors, il a parlé toujours de l'identité et des histoires de famille dans les familles. Thanks so much, Blanche. Springwater. Merci um, beaucoup, yeah, and Springwater. I, I'm really happy to be here as well. Je suis and I'd très like heureux d'être là. Adele, um, Merci, for Adèle, work on the 40 days pour votre travail and, and Springwater, uh, 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 sur le racisme et de book Springwater. And, and for, uh, de, je la remercie aussi d'avoir lu tonight. mon so, livre um, et de m'avoir présenté à vous. Alors, c'est un plaisir, puisque ces livres-là ont été écrits, enfin, ce livre a été écrit déjà en 2019, puis très français. Uh, Donc c'est un plaisir de vous le so présenter. Could, uh, kind of je vais le dire en français, de, Donc, de sorte... Uh, je dirais merci uh, à Springwater et aussi à Adèle. Uh, Adèle, maintenant, uh, me disait que c'est la troisième année qu'il y a les 40 jours d'antiracisme. Donc c'est vraiment quelque chose à, à lui féliciter. Et uh, je suis très content d'être ici avec vous. So, um, I often get asked Uh, when I started doing this particular type of research, On me demande souvent quand est-ce que je commençais à faire specific, ce genre de recherche et, um, et c'est très spécifique. Je pense que ma réponse est toujours la même. J'étais à l'université de Trent um, dans les études sort of, uh, ethniques. Uh, on travaillait sur les affaires concernant les peuples autochtones, des peuples And I remember that in that Yukon, course, there was a majority of white students. There were quite a few indigenous students. The majority of us were white students. Uh, blanc, and Uh, um, et quelques most of us wanted to do sort of the, the end of term la plupart de nous on voulait faire un travail de really fin de cours sur the, les peuples autochtones et elle a le professeur a demandé uh, aux really étudiants de vraiment de rechercher à savoir qui ils étaient quelle était leur identité alors, um, c'était une bonne idée, time, uh, et à partir de là, uh, ça m'a uh, ouvert les yeux à, à ce champ, uh, of, of et ça m'a uh, ouvert uh, les portes à, pour le fait d'étudier le racisme, les so certaines attitudes des Canadiens blancs et des um, so Québécois. Et ça fait quand même quelques, quelques années, et alors ces projets sont devenus grands, a grandi, c'était pas mieux. Et 
Et le livre est sorti justement de conversations avec des collègues et je me suis aperçu qu'il y avait énormément de groupes qui s'est leur apparence et qui, euh, où il y avait des doutes sur l'identité des gens, il y a un phénomène, alors c'est un phénomène, est-ce qu'on peut l'appeler l'auto-autochtonisation le suppression d'identité, enfin je ne sais pas, mais c'est un phénomène. Has really taken off in our society. Euh, so, et c'est un phénomène uh, qui est de plus en plus répandu. Selon moi, il y a um, entre 2000 et 200 000 like me, Canadiens Canadian, français um, who are qui claims to being indigenous, souhaitent largely based devenir ou qui font la demande de devenir so euh, reconnu autochtone. Like Alors, avant de, comment, de commencer, j'aimerais so savoir vous présenter um, une diapositive. Um, some... J'ai Um, some images from the book in English and also the book in French. des images, um, so enfin, il y a ici, des images sort of de mon livre en, en français et sa version française aussi. Like Alors voilà, donc vous allez trouver qu'il y a des English, images uh, en français et en anglais. Uh, et quand même, je vais vous dire que la plupart de ma présentation va se passer en français. Donc, permettez-moi de vous présenter l'écran. Voilà, je suis à mon bureau de l'Université d'Ottawa. <laughs> je suis un de peu qui reste so this là is, ce uh, soir. Really my first at, <coughs> Donc voici sort of mon premier essai de revenir deux aspects de ma recherche. C'est-à-dire la double fonction de la généalogie et des histoires de famille dans l'auto-autochtonisation. Et je pense que cette recherche me mène à une autre question et je viendrai sans doute à un moment donné à parler de... Des in, histoires um, de famille book, chez les Blancs. This, um, Alors, euh, j'ai ici, par exemple, vous voyez, euh, I mean, dans um, le chapitre 1, vous voyez, il y a les colonnes blancs qui utilisent les femmes autochtones, les colonnes blancs. Just so unclear. I'm not saying Sur francophones, I'm je ne veux pas French, dire que tous les Québécois ou que tous les descendants de, Some of them live in other provinces. de Français um, euh, le font. Il y a même um, des gens qui ont parlé <coughs> français qui ne le parlent plus. Uh, sorry, 13 to 14 million of us in Canada. Il y a à peu près 13 à 14 millions de, de nous au right. Canada. Et so, um, I developed this idea of the mechanics of descent donc, to kind of um, donc, explain how genealogy de la pour expliquer que la généalogie est une pratique et c'est quelque chose qu'on fait. Parce qu'on fait quelque chose de nos ancêtres. Il ne s'agit pas que de remonter dans le temps et de trouver la vérité de nos ancêtres. Il s'agit In many ways, as I'll demonstrate, kind of transforming the identities of our actual ancestors. And so that's what I mean by uh, the mechanics of descent. And so in this book, I develop, um, as you see here in the English version, there's three, ver there's three sort of uh, mechanics of descent, lineal descent, aspirational descent, and lateral descent. And in this presentation today, I'm going to talk euh, about the first two. So you see here in French, c'est l'ascendance linéaire et l'ascendance ambitieuse. And so, lineal descent is the most, you know, the most common form of, of, of genealogical research. There's nothing particularly um, novel about naming it lineal descent. Um, for those of you who may have been asked in the past, uh, perhaps when you were a child in, in primary school, maybe even later on, to bring a family tree to, to school. And so you bring a family tree, and lineal descent is essentially this idea that you're following a straight line back into your past. And so that line could fall on your mother's side, your father's side, uh, you know, your mother's mother's side, your mother's father's side. And so that's what's meant by um, a particular family line. 
and that's why it's called uh, linear descent. So you go back as far as you can, in the, it's not a straight line, but in a line in that family, um, and you find out what you can about that family. And so that in and of itself is not, it's not some sort of novel, but when I talk about the mechanics of linear descent, I'm introducing this idea that it's not, again, just about finding out about your specific family line but about transforming that line in many ways to meet the desire that you might have today, whatever desires that might be. And so one thing that, um, one thing that I, I uh, actually, I mean, let me back up just a moment because I didn't really set out what I'm studying. So uh, the material of what I'm studying are five different And that's really the basis for the first part of the book when I'm looking at this mechanics of descent. Three of the genealogical forms are in French, two of them are in English. And the reason I use genealogical forms as opposed to um, uh, social media, right, because there's a lot of Facebook groups, there's a lot of uh, Facebook groups about genealogy, is because I wanted to go uh, back in time prior to the existence of social media. Um, and so by using the online term, genealogy uh, forums, I can go back in, in one case, one of the forums um, was created in 2001. So much before um, we were really using social media. And so three of them are in French, two of them are in are English, and they're all geared towards French descendants. They're all there to help French descendants in some way um, either discover about their discover things about their ancestors, and some of them are specific to indigeneity, indigenous peoples, and their indigenous ancestry, and some of them are more broad but had specific threads, if you will, uh, conversations about those uh, topics around indigeneity. And so, um, the, the five genealogical forms are the basis for this first part of the study. And so, that's where I started to really understand that there's something that's being done with ancestors. People talk about ancestors in particular ways, sometimes transform the ancestors' identities in particular ways. And so it's really, in many ways, what we find out, or I found out while doing this research, is that the identities of particular individuals in the past are less important than what people want their identity to be today. And that's probably not very surprising to you, um, but that's one of the things that um, becomes very clear in this research. Right. And so one of one of the things um, about lineal descent, for instance, that uh, I guess I'd like to I'd like to talk about here is the way, in particular, just a handful of indigenous women get used, um, by individuals um, on these forums, and things. You know, this time I'm working on these forums, forums, I've come to discover um, that indigenous women are used the same way across a range of organizations by thousands of people. And before I continue, I also want to point out that as part of this book, I did my own genealogy and discovered that um, I have um, three indigenous women in my ancestry. All three are born before 1650, and that that's a relatively common phenomenon. So for French descendants, the large majority of us, um, you know, historical demographers say that 75% of us will have a small amount of indigenous ancestry, largely because... Um, Anywhere from 5 to 10 indigenous women, it's actually 13, some of them have children, but 5 to 10 indigenous women marry Frenchmen um, before 1660, and there's a very small group of people in New France at that time, so um, most French descendants are related to at least one or two of those women, just like I am. and that's uh, not that uncommon, it's true of the Prime Minister of Canada, it's true of the Premier of Quebec, it's true of Céline Dion, it's true of Mario Lemieux, it's true of Maurice Richard, I can go on, it's true of most of us, so much so that about 10 million of us in Canada today have this specific ancestry. Now, of course, 10 million of us aren't saying we're indigenous because of it, but several hundred thousand are. And that's really sort of the basis of, of this research. And so here's an example of someone, actually Robert, who lives in the United States. And for those who aren't aware, um, between 1850 and 1910, uh, about 500,000 people uh, immigrated to New England. Um, so right now in New England, there's uh, probably around 3 million French descendants. Um, and so it's not common on these English language forums to see American citizens who are Franco-Americans, as we may call them, 
Il y a des franco-américains qui essaient de they découvrir ancestors. So Robert, qui ont des ancêtres autochtones. Robert a partagé ses découvertes. Maggie Sylvest est um, une Huron-Wendat Algonquin woman. Il parlait de 1624. Marie Olivier. Et donc, en septembre 2011, il a dit que je suis aussi capable de retrouver mes ancêtres à ces deux personnes. Donc, j'ai pu retrouver mes ancêtres jusqu'à Marie Oliver Sylvestre en 1644. J'ai toujours senti que c'était quelque chose et que c'était un peu plus important que mon père. Donc, j'avais l'impression qu'il y avait de l'autre côté. Donc, peux-je avoir le statut pour moi et mes enfants et où et où nous allons revendiquer ce statut indien Alors, comment est-ce que je fais C'est un exemple d'un affichage que l'on voit dans ces forums. Ce sont des nouveaux pour moi. J'ai commencé à découvrir ces spécimens en 1644 et comment ils circulaient dans nos pays. Et comment ils sont utilisés dans mes études de ces spécimens. Et comment ils sont utilisés dans mes études de ces spécimens. Et donc, dans ces différents forums, dans ces 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 And Robert is encouraged to apply for membership in a number of different organizations to say that he's indigenous or in the American context, Native American. You know, and some of these organizations produce cards that resemble a legitimate Canada status card or a United States tribal citizenship card. And so there's a lot of back and forth and advice and stuff like that that sort of circulates on the forums about how one can transform themselves. As you can see here, Robert made a relatively recent discovery, but wants to transform his entire il y en a d'autres que je veux vous présenter. Par exemple, un tableau que j'ai produit, j'ai compté le nombre de descendants que les trois femmes que j'ai vues Kept seeing over and over and over again. Toi, femme, que je voyais, Remember que that um, dans if you're a French descendant, you're going to be related to a small group of people. Um, you know, we're donc, talking about a few hundred people. Uh, il y aura quelques centaines de personnes qui seront au début de la famille. And a few of those are likely the indigenous women, and these three women are the ones who are the most common. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. And I didn't know this prior to writing Arrived in New France, and so she had a child with Jean Jesuit. Some of you may recognize the name Nicolas. There's a town in Quebec called Nicolas. There's a monument in the street named after Nicolas. He was one of Champlain's lieutenants. He was sent to Champlain. He was sent west to Nipissing territory, essentially North Bay. And he stayed there for seven or eight years. He returned to Quebec City with a child. He returned to Quebec enfant. And so when we talk about Nipissing woman, she was born sometime before 1610, likely around 1605. And had a child with Jean Nicolas. We don't know what happened to her. All we know is that Nicolas brought their daughter away from her family to Quebec City, where she was then raised by a Parisian family, and then later by the Sulpician educational facility, if we can call it. In fact, no, by an école, an école rich, what we call it today, an école residential for girls. And so she, so you can see here what I did is I counted. The number of descendants that each one of these women have come up over and over again, and the records had by the fifth generation. You can see that the Sylvester woman had 123 descendants. La femme que la femme de Pissing avait Marie Sylvester was born in 1624. It was actually raised in the same household and in the same religious institution as the Nipissing woman's daughter, and so they were contemporaries and knew each other. Uh, and you can see here that Donc, by fifth generation, whoops, sorry about that, she has 10 times more descendants than the Pacific woman, uh, which means, you know, if we were going to, and I'll get to this in a moment, think about how many descendants they have today, 
Oui, oui. Mais si on pense à un nombre de descendants, ils ont, on, on sait que c'est Marie Céleste qui va en avoir beaucoup plus que la femme Epstein. Et ensuite, il y a Marie Météo Magou Kwe, une femme algonquine, née vers 1631, et on voit qu'à la cinquième génération, elle en a I'm quote unquote related to the first ouais, woman in this list and the third. J'ai d'apparenté avec la right. so première et la troisième de cette liste. And so this is sort of a correction, if you were, donc, a corrective ça, une of my research. I'll explain what's going on here. So there's a really large donc, scale program. It is the social science research program in Canada that has received the most funding et and in, in le uh, programme, uh, social science research history, au, au um, tens of millions of dollars. De it's ran out of the University of Montreal. Montreal. It's called the Programme de Recherche en Démographie Story. And so what they've done is they've fait, digitized fait, all of the existing uh, records um, from New France up until actually any Quebec and anything that touches French descendants until 1849. And so the first documents that they digitized are from 1621, and they've digitized them all the way to 1849. They have almost 2 million digitized documents that are vital records. And so they're mostly church documents, some of them are civil records. And this, by um, vital records, I mean birth, um, baptism. Et, um, marriage and baptême, de mariage, um, and so de according décès. to their figures, donc, I had contacted them after publishing the book and asked them if they could run a program to see how many descendants demandé, uh, each one of these four uh, women, I added a fourth uh, woman, you can see, uh, Map Gideon Pigarouich, who's the daughter of a well-known Algonquin man, and you can see I'm also quote-unquote related to her, so these are the three women that I'm related to, these three, the first three, the three that I'm quote-unquote related to. So by the eighth generation, which corresponds uh, with about the middle of the 1800s, that's why the figures stop there. Remember that they've only digitized until then. You can see that um, the Nipissing woman's daughter, or Nipissing woman, has had 60,000 descendants. Uh, uh, Marie Mouté had over 68,000, Marguerite Pierre had 185,000, and Marie Sebastien had 184,000. Now, if we were to take those figures from the middle of the 1800s into today, what ends up happening is um, Marie Sylvestre has about 2 million descendants today. So, if you're asking why is he going on about all of these sort of the number of descendants that these people have, it's to demonstrate that these four women combined likely have between les, four les and five million living descendants. De and à so having de descendants one of these women in your ancestry in no way Donc, makes someone that's the que basis vous avez of your claim. In no way makes someone indigenous, uh, qui, qui um, est un but it certainly has sort of pushed many people in our society uh, to make it to make it sense. Okay, so I'm going to go to um, Donc, another way to think about um, this data. So these are three organized, uh, sorry, four organizations who, whose sort of membership lists um, are available publicly and that I analyze as part of writing this book. And you can see here that I've, I've listed those four women again, and I've, I've verified how they're used by each of the, uh, whether they're used by each of these organizations. Um, and so you can see here that there's an Abenaki group in New Hampshire. And so the sample size was 918 members. They use Maggie Sebes, who was not Abenaki. Remember that she was Algonquin in here on Wendat. Maddie Mite, who is also Algonquin. She's also used. So she's the second most common root ancestor who is used by this group. She's the third most common. When it comes to a Métis organization, and I say this in quotation marks, in Manawaki, so about an hour and a half north of Ottawa in Quebec, Marie Sylvestre is used the most often. And of course, this isn't super surprising because she would be most likely the indigenous woman who factors into the genealogy of French descendants the most often today. And you can see how these four women are used by this Métis organization, often quite often, uh, quite a bit. In the Algonquins of Ontario, you can see here, again, all four of them are used. And then finally, this Métis organization uh, on the North Shore of Quebec, 
France. Vous savez ici, la communauté métisse du domaine du roi et de la seigneurie de Minga. Il y a deux femmes qui n'ont pas. Pourquoi est-ce que je parle de ceci? Parce que souvent, on a des personnes qui euh, ils veulent honorer leurs ancêtres, mais en fait, ils sont en train de les déshonorer parce qu'ils se disent d'être abénaqués, puis ils utilisent des noms des femmes qui ne sont pas abénaqués. Et alors, qu'est-ce qu'ils veulent faire avec ceci Ils veulent transformer leur identité et puis ils vont aller chercher And so that's what I mean when I say that pas, uh, there's a mechanic of descent, there's something that we do with our ancestors that meets our desires. Il y a quelque chose qui arrive qu'on fait lorsqu'on a un désir vraiment de devenir autochtone. Alors que ce soit à Benaké, Nouveau-Ki, ou que l'on veut être à Gonkan, Ontario, ou autre dans d'autres régions. Alors, <coughs> And so one other thing I just wanted to point out here, this is the third page of book, um, is uh, uh, sort of the, the, the average, I'll go back to the English la... moment, so the average French descent in genealogy in terms of its uh, sort of uh, makeup, la uh, and so I am then compared uh, to my, uh, my genealogy. Uh, And so you can see here, and this is according to historical demographers who work on that project that I shared in the genealogy project I mentioned earlier. And so you can see that the average French descendant has 97.6% of the ancestors. So the ancestors going back to the early 1600s are French. C'est des Français. Il y a moins d'un an pour ça. Un an pour ça. Un an pour ça. Un an pour ça. Il y a quelques Européens, des Belges, notamment. Il y a un peu de postal worker, je pense que vous pouvez dire, le mailman dans Québec City. Il y avait des gens comme les facteurs qui apparaissent là. Et ensuite, on a un virgule. So mine, mine is quite comparable to the average Alors, sort of French descent of uh, genealogy. You can see mine is a little bit less tableau, French, a little bit more uh, English, a voyez, little bit more uh, other European, and about the same indigenous uh, in terms of the overall ancestry moi, going back et, to the early 1600s. Et, et là, 95, One thing that I find helps to Français, illustrate the way in which anglais, um, this move 3, to claim an indigenous identity by French 5, descendants is enfin, really quite political, um, is donc, if you look uh, here, on peut voir ce qu'il y a des motifs politiques pour vouloir uh, devenir um, autochtone. Parce que la... you don't see le French pourcentage de sang autochtone euh, right? est très, très petit. On ne voit pas des francophones loud, qui euh, revendiquent well, le statut d'anglophone. De, de, on ne voit pas ça. Pourquoi est-ce qu'il y aurait des Blancs qui souhaiteraient revendiquer le statut autochtone um, and it's actually quite harmful. Il y a quelque chose qui n'est pas I'd like to see it so that it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make et sense. It's not intelligible. Ça n'a in fait pas de sens. Et c'est pourquoi je me suis penchée okay. sur la question. And so I just wanted to briefly touch upon um, the et second descent. This is what I call aspirational mécanique, descent. La deuxième, and la I think this one really helps to illustrate et, uh, the sort of fantastical que, nature, if you will, of these claims. Um, even more de ce, than the first de, one. De, de, de ce and so this is, um, you know, this is a, a profile of a particular uh, 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 family, sœurs, I guess you can say, in an ancestral family. En fait, Um, that uh, appears on the ancienne, fairly well-known forum. Um, qui est <coughs> connu dans les forums. So I'm just going to go through it um, rather quickly. I just want to see what I don't have in French. No. Je vais aller assez rapidement là-dessus. Okay. And so um, this is what it's telling us. This woman here, uh, Alors, and I, I want to point out that this is not a truthful It's not truthful information, but it's the type of information Alors, that counts as truthful. It's on these forms uh, and then gets used by people to claim an indigenous identity. Il so remember that chose. about three quarters of French descendants will find an indigenous ancestor in their um, ancestry, Alors, but about a quarter of us won't. And so for those who uh, don't, there are French women who are turned into indigenous women. Alors, par exemple, so that nous avons l'exemple de Marguerite M. Mi'kmaq, um, 
qui est française et qui euh, est prétendue autochtone parce qu'on l'a utilisée okay. so pour two des revendications. Catherine et Edmé Lejeune qui sont acadiennes. Donc so les deux sœurs, Catherine et Edmé Lejeune, qui sont des, des, des <coughs> sœurs the, uh, nées en Nouvelle-Écosse dans les années 1600. Et voici un peu leur histoire. Et donc, il est dit qu'une femme nommée Marguerite Mi'kmaq Um, was born in 1585, and that her parents are Henry Member II and Mary Abenaki. Henry Member II is an actual historical figure. Um, there's a Mi'kmaq community that's called Member II, and that's sort of because that this figure was the grand chief of the Mi'kmaq who met the French uh, early on in the late 1500s. And so one of the things that happens with aspirational descent is that actual historical figures, indigenous figures, mostly men, are part of the story to give it a sort of the allure of truth. Alors. Pourquoi right. je vous le dis, c'est so parce que la plupart des personnes, c'est des hommes, et des hommes so et ils utilisent des personnages. Child, Mary, Alors, Mig, uh, il y avait cette femme-là qui était mariée, married to a Frenchman who's born in 1595. They have the story goes, these two children. Et c'est de là, Pierre Lejeune, Brunant, So the story is that this woman, Mi'kmaq, filles, Catherine her parents give her up Donc, to the French to sort of build kinship relations. She's transported to France, marries Français. a Frenchman, has two Elle children there, and then returns to Nova Scotia. France. Okay, a this is enfants. not supported by actual Elle documentary evidence. Avec deux um, there are some problems with France. this file, though, if you can Alors, y a un problème you can see ici that. Que Sorry, I don't know why that's happening. C'est One of the jeu. problems is that bon, if you look at when um, que... Mary Abenaki, Margaret's Marie mother, is born, Abenaki, she's born in 1582, uh, and Margaret is born Margaret in 1585. Mi-Mac. So um, it's obviously quite unlikely that Mary had a child when she was three years old, et, uh, um, unless something really elle spectacular n'est pas pu has happened in the 1500s, so we're just not aware of that. Um, there are other things that don't just quite don't quite uh, work out in terms of the timeline. Ne, she has a child in 1625, but she dies in 1611. Again, quite different than uh, children would have lost in 1625. But in fact, we know that so there are ways in which this story, though, regardless of its truth, alors, circulates online so much so that Catherine and Edmé Lejeune are actually coup, accepted as pas, Indigenous uh, women, logique. Indigenous root ancestors by a range of organizations. And so Alors, I just want to give you a couple examples. This, uh, you can see here that I've redacted the person's name. It's an individual who was born in 1986. Uh, and this is the Manawak Community Organization. Again, it's about an hour and a half north of Ottawa. They have um, par, several thousand uh, members. At last count, they were sharing 6,000 members. Um, and so <coughs> this is one of their membership records for one of the individuals, Ça, which they un, presented uh, in the court case in 2016. So they're And so you can see that this individual is claiming a 13th generation ici, ancestor, Catherine Lejeune. Remember, we just saw Catherine Lejeune. And you can see 13. that she is il, um, identified as Mi'kmaq. So mixed race Mi'kmaq woman. Uh, um, it's married in 1650. That's um, obviously alors, not true. If you remember, il, she's il a Canadian uh, woman, who, a girl who's born in 1650. Um, but this story circulating that she's the grandchild of Member Two, the grandchild of the Mi'kmaq, has really taken root to the point where uh, all of these different organizations who exist Pourquoi? Parce qu'en fait, um, cette in Quebec, était un grand chef in Nova Scotia, groupe, in Brunswick, in Ontario, and also in New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire, déjà, Ontario, except Catherine Lejeune, who is Québec, one of my ancestors as well, um, as, and also one of uh, Justin Trudeau's ancestors as uh, an Indigenous woman. And we see here another file. This person was born in 1969. Basically, the, the, the same Imaginez. story, um, except for Catherine histoire. Lejeune, it's her sister, Edmé, not related oh, to her. On me parle um, de Catherine see, Lejeune, she's a 13th gen- this person is a 13th generation descendant of Edmé Lejeune. And that in and of itself une... is enough to give this person um, a membership in this 
Euh, ils utilisent ces personnes-là et ils vont à une organisation. Euh, eux, ils leur permettent de s'inscrire derrière comme membres, alors que leur histoire ne tient pas de vous. Alors, c'est pour ça que la deuxième partie de ma recherche va étudier justement tous les organisations et comment ces ancestrales claims sont émergées. Which specific, it's almost always women are being used, how they're being Alors, used, qu va, um, and really how they're being femmes, used. La plupart du temps. And so you Et can see fait, here in this pas, case, we, um, when we can't find an indigenous session. ancestor, because these two individuals, passe, what happens with these membership files pas, is if there are other uh, indigenous uh, ancestors in the person's uh, background, uh, it'll be part of the file, so it'll be others who are listed. But these two individuals don't have any other quote-unquote indigenous ancestors. Et qu'est-ce qui se passe dans les associations euh, qui, one of the euh, sisters. So if you qui don't have an indigenous ancestor, you make one. Ils classent les dossiers et puis voilà. Euh, ils peuvent devenir Now membres, ils sont adhérés well, really et nice, puis ils vont mean? continuer There are à faire of these organizations leur... who show their cards, um, who have, Alors, um, qu'est-ce qui se passe par la suite La plupart de ces personnes-là qui ont obtenu une um, carte de l'université vont devenir des professeurs, vont aller chercher des postes qui sont sont euh, normalement euh, destinés au so aux you need to do is de say, la communauté hey, autochtone. Et ils vont aller chercher toutes sortes de faveurs. Et c'est pourquoi euh, il y a eu à un moment donné um, euh, euh, un arrêt qui a dû être... Euh, All right. Fait par la cour, so euh, before I move to this question of family lore, I just wanted to check in with bon, Spring Water to see, um, auto, I'm not actually auto going through any of the chat or anything like euh, that, I find it a bit distracting when I'm, I'm kind of presenting les, material. So I just wanted to go to Alors, Spring Water to see if there are any questions or comments that we can take before we skip to the family lore. Sir, we do have a couple of questions. I'm just wondering how long do you think we have for questions, Daryl? Just wondering how long do you think we have for questions, Daryl? I don't know, we could take 10 or 15 questions. On va voir. Okay. On va All right. So Nicole is wondering, what are your thoughts around the DNA Alors. testing? Alors, on veut savoir qu'est-ce que yeah, vous pensez des so, tests actually, de DNA. Book, you DNA testing Effectivement, je, je discute de ça um, dans mon euh, livre. En général, je ne Now, suis pas très en faveur clear, though, de ces tests. Et je veux dire pourquoi. Ça ne, ça ne veut pas dire que je ne suis pas du tout d'accord. You can um, have a, a particular type of, of DNA testing that's about exemple, identifying family avoir, members, right? Uh, and so it could be type de ADN, parents, it could be cousins, ADN, that sort of thing. Sometimes that's called DNA ancestry testing. Proche. What I'm talking Mais about in relation to that is when um, the type of ancestry gueule, testing where you're trying to assess one's identity, test, not um, whether you're connected to an individual, right? So if you're connected to a second cousin or... You know, you have a paternity test and you want to know if someone's connected to you as their, as their child. So this Alors, is something different. DNA ancestry euh, testing, si I think the most euh, important work on that topic été, euh, is really done by Dr. Kim Talbert. And uh, Kim Alors, Talbert is, is um, a professor at the University of Alberta. She's a Dakota woman. And um, she wrote a book called Native American Alors, DNA that really explains the sort of risks aussi, uh, la that come with Smart, defining uh, indigeneity and uh, indigenous identity, qui really beaucoup, identities uh, according to a strict understanding of biology. Sur right? so that's, peuvent that's être considérés comme des that's what factuels. my work car elles sont liées à la relation complexe in a way, entre right, le pouvoir that, social, personnel um, et culturel et social. Dans mon avis, ce qui se passe en ce moment, c'est que les gens sont en train de découvrir des choses biologiques qui sont en train de faire des Uh, and that's something that Kim Talbert has really explained quite well. And so, you know, um, my work is about white people, 
It's not so much about indigenous people, but because there's a boundary there that's being sort of in a way pushed and challenged, obviously there, there, there's a discussion that occurs around both of those identities. And one thing that's happened that's clear since the 1970s and 80s is that white people are trying to disinvest themselves from whiteness. They're trying to become anything white. And so um, there's a lot of research in the United States by sociologists, anthropologists, and others who explain that process. Process that really occurs in the midst, in the, sort of after the civil rights movement, where um, you see the sort of creation of new ethnic, white ethnic minorities. So all of a sudden, Irish Americans and Italian Americans, groups of people whose ancestors arrived in the late 1800s, um, you know, and weren't necessarily considered part of the great white family. Uh, had to work hard to be understood uh, as white de la because they were Blanche, poor and they were seen as uh, not part of the sort of Anglo-Saxon majority. Um, all of a sudden, come the 1970s and 80s, those, their descendants, they don't want to be white anymore, uh, right? And they want to be um, part of some sort of ethnic minority so that they can say, I'm not involved in the historic forms of racism, whether it's slavery, whether it's settler colonialism. One of the compliments of corollary of that is that those white Americans who are present, um, whose ancestors go back to the Mayflower, the pilgrims, you know, who go back to the 1600s, they start to discover that they have, quote unquote, indigenous princesses in their backgrounds. And so you see one of the identities that, that becomes, um, I guess, over uh, represented in census results are uh, that Americans are starting to really start at that point in time in the 80s, uh, sorry, the 70s and 80s, and 80s to identify as charities. And so there's a whole sort of body of literature that demonstrates those two things are happening at the same time, and that's also true to some extent in So there's pilgrimages that Scottish Canadians, for instance, go to in the highlands to sort of relive their, if you want, their brave heart days. And so people in Scotland are just like, what is going on? <laughs> you know, that's not who we are today. And we don't recognize who you think your ancestors are because that's not the story we have about what it was like to be in the highlands. Um, but there's a way in which that kind of gets romanticized. And um, <clears throat> so I guess what I'm saying here is that these are all identities are social and political to some extent. For some reason, as a society, and this is part of the settler colonial project, we have rendered indigenous identity a question of biology, a question of really of race. And indigenous peoples have been telling us for hundreds of years that they're, they're nations, they're people, with their own forms of citizenship orders and legal orders that really are, are based in kinship relations. They are based in sort of the obligations that come with making um, And so, you know, my research alongside the research of Kim Talbert and Pam Palmer and others who have really written about um, the importance of respecting indigenous sovereignty and self-determination demonstrate, I think, how this movement is fundamentally um, about expressing a racist logic. A logic that seeks to eliminate indigenous people logique, as people. Uh, yeah. When I say eliminate, that might seem harsh and it might sound like I'm saying um, physical si elimination, mot, and that certainly pouvez, has been part pouvez, of history. But I am also saying here that it's about eliminating the crown, the federal government's responsibility to indigenous people that have been um, codified in different treaties and agreements. So I'm not, um, I'm, I'm, I'm following the lead of my, um, my indigenous colleagues, and I do not in any way think that DNA ancestry tests can demonstrate that one is indigenous. Thank you for that, Daryl. Um, I'm just wondering if um, you might be able to uh, explain to us how um, these newly these newly 
discovered, founded Métis Comment people and organizations, how are they linked to um, uh, anti-Indigenous sentiment? Le statut de Métis, uh, sure. Comment yeah. Est-ce que ces mouvements, Thank you, uh, Springwater. So yeah, I mean, the second part of my book, I generally tend to focus on the first part is people, to, to kind of explain how this movement works. The second part of the book um, is really looking at two organizations that emerge um, essentially in the middle of the 2000s, so 2005, 2006. One on the north shore of the St. Lawrence in a new territory in Quebec and one on the south shore of the St. Lawrence in Gaspésie in Mi'kmaq territory. And both of those movements have um, some resemblance. Uh, and so you had mentioned this earlier, Springwater, one of the sort of ways in which uh, I think the North Shore movement, that's chapter four of my book, um, really sort of uh, illustrates how this drive to become indigenous among French descendants is is really oftentimes based on sort of a political desire to oppose actual First Nations people. Now, I, before I continue, people hear that and, and will often say, well, it's not like everyone has those motivations. And I've never suggested that. Um, and individuals will have all kinds of an array of different motivations, regardless of people's motivations. Claiming that you're indigenous when you're not is harmful. To indigenous but this movement in particular um, on the North Shore was a, right rights, a white rights movement. And so as it happens across the country when there are land claim negotiations, which there was at the time in a new territory and had been for a couple decades, and they were kind of coming to, um, I don't want to say a close, but they were, you know, moving along this process, there was an agreement of principle that was released. It hasn't really moved since then, um, which often is the case with my claims. And so what happened when the agreement of principle was released was that there was a huge backlash in the local Quebecois population on the North Shore, so we're talking about Sainte-Île, Bécomo, um, Lac Saint-Jean, Saguenay, Chicoutimi, those areas. And um, as part of that backlash, there was this um, sort of movement of, 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 of white Québécois people. They call themselves the... Uh, the uh, what were they called? I'm trying to translate it in my head, but um, essentially there were the, yeah, the white rights, the white rights group. And as happens uh, pretty much all over in Canada, when there are these types of claims, white people will often argue that their rights are being diminished in some way, that land is being taken away from them. That was never the case with the land claim. First Nations and Indian people have made that clear for literally decades. I've been reaching out to communities all of this time, trying to make it clear what it was that they were trying to get through these land claims. But in any case, this is what happened. And um, then there was a court case, uh, a Supreme Court of Canada case that came down in 2003 that recognized um, that Métis people had Aboriginal rights under Section 35 of the Constitution. And so that recognized a particular community um, in Sault Ste. Marie in Ontario, specific to that community, but it set out a criteria um, and suggested that anyone anywhere in Canada could possibly pass that test and meet that criteria. And so the people who founded the white rights group and um, were I mean, among the most vociferous, essentially white supremacists, you know, they, the things that they were saying about the Indian were absolutely horrible. Almost overnight, as this, as this case was released, it started to sort of you know, filter down into the community. They started to call themselves Métis. And so they saw it as an opportunity to um, put a stop to the land claim. And they were very clear about that. The federal government needs to, and the provincial government needs to negotiate with us because we're an indigenous people, um, just like the ANU, and we have the same rights. And if they're going to sign a land claim with them, they are, they are somehow, you know, they're um, contravening our rights. And so that was their argument. Um, it's not that the argument was particularly successful. It did uh, throw a wrench in the land claims, and the land claims has never been resolved. Uh, this organization um, sort of has splintered. There are three of them in the region now, um, with about, uh, last time I saw, about uh, 15,000 paying members. Um, so people pay a yearly um, membership fee. They were the first organization in Quebec to go um, to court, provincial court, um, to be recognized as having Aboriginal rights under the Constitution as a Métis people. 
that case took many, many years to go through the courts, and eventually they lost. One thing to know is that I've been tracking uh, court cases um, <coughs> that are making these types of claims, where individuals or organizations are making these types of claims. Um, there have been about 150 court cases in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, Quebec. There have been two in British Columbia. Um, they involve a array of different types of claims. Um, mostly, there are individuals, men who go out on the land and are stopped because they're hunting or fishing without a license, or they've overhunted or fished, uh, and donc, then uh, they go to court <laughs> to, um, um, to have their ensuite, to see if donc, um, the court will recognize them as having Aboriginal rights. De, Every de single one of these cases, the individuals or organizations have lost. Cas, gens ont perdu. <coughs> and so that's something that's really interesting les about this movement, perdu, donc, it has not been very successful. De, de, de um, First Nations in these territories, uh, so, uh, uh, from, from the Mi'kmaq out um, east, Les to, Premières Nations, um, the Algonquin uh, Anishinaabe, uh, uh, where I am in uh, uh, the, uh, the sort of uh, Ottawa, just, uh, Ottawa uh, River Valley, uh, uh, Ottawa uh, River Watershed, uh, I should say, region, uh, have uh, spoken uh, out forcefully uh, against uh, this movement uh, as well. Um, and the federal uh, and provincial governments uh, have, have uh, not recognized movement, groups that are part of, I guess you could say, this movement as legitimately indigenous. So then why are we talking about it? Because our institutions Parce que have. Nos institutions so again, universities, fait. school boards, um, hospital boards, um, federal bureaucracies, arts organizations, arts councils, the list goes on. So many arts, institutions in our society have, have you know, mistakenly, whatever one wants to say, innocently, regardless of what their intentions were, have recognized these individuals making these claims to be members of these organizations as legitimately indigenous, again, creating a great deal of harm um, to indigenous people. And so that's just one example. I could talk about the other one in more territory, but it's virtually the same thing. So my research, which was actually supported in, in, I, I went and visited a friend who's a new um, from one of these a new First Nations in that region. Um, uh, just as I was sort of sitting down to start thinking about this book, and I was gifted, um, I think it was 15 DVDs full of data. Um, and it was all of the material from these court cases. And so um, that's when I really was able to sit down and look at who these people were prior to turning into the quote unquote chief of the regional Métis organization or the, you know, whatever it was that they were calling themselves, the knowledge people as they will uh, often sort of, um, or the uh, elder, uh, as they'll often call themselves. La, uh, and so that's, you can imagine, it's pretty difficult uh, for everyday Canadians who don't have a lot of information or knowledge about Indigenous Canadians peoples to really sort out, like, what is it about these claims? I would suggest, actually, that it becomes easy to accept these claims because these people are us. Right? And if there's a familiarity with the individuals making the claims that uh, makes accepting them um, feel good. I'm wondering if you could answer one more question before you continue. <coughs> My, um, Emo is asking why there needs to be an intervention on the Eastern Métis. Why? Yeah, so just, just to be clear, like um, the Eastern Métis, that's kind of... Um, a term that's guillemets. generally est given to this movement, so this Eastern Métis movement. Donc, uh, I do want to be Métis clear, though, that one thing that's disant. happened in the past eh bien, five or six years as there's been more clair, scrutiny of this movement ans, is that uh, more and more uh, people are turning to uh, Algonquin uh, claims or Mi'kmaq claims. Plus plus genre, and so they're kind of dropping uh, the claim that they're Métis. They're just saying straight out that they're Algonquin or Mi'kmaq or uh, in some cases, Abenaki, as we see in the United cas, States, Abenaki, they'll sometimes say that they're non-status, which is really a misunderstanding of what non-status means. And you can't go back to the 1600s and have an ancestor and say that you're non-status today. The Indian Act only comes into being in 1876. That's when status exists, and people start losing it after that. So if you don't have an ancestor after 1876, you lose a status and you can't be non-status today. But there's a way in which people try to legitimize their claims and confuse people, right? Confuse well meaning well-intentioned people. And so in terms of the Eastern Métis movement, um, why it's important to intervene in it, I, I think I've sort of laid that out somewhat. Um, but, uh, you know, my sense is that it, 
uh, First Nations people in particular, but also Métis people and Inuit people have fought very, very hard to at least have a seat at the table in some instances. Uh, in institutions at the very least, right? It's not like representation is going to change um, everything in society, but representation is at least the start. Um, often those individuals in those positions are are members of communities, they can bring the knowledge that they gain, they can bring the money they make in those positions, they can actually make a difference in their communities. Right? And so what we have here are people who have no connection to indigenous peoples, oftentimes promoting extremely harmful ideas about what it means to be indigenous, and particularly First Nations or Métis, um, and they're given the position as a spokesperson for indigenous people. They're there to represent in in many cases, First Nations children, First Nations families, survivors of residential schools, et cetera, et cetera. They're given those positions that Indigenous peoples have fought tooth and nail to get, right? And then all of a sudden, they're there as the spokesperson. And they will often, and the thing that it's just, it's it's hard to see happen. And I can only imagine how it feels if you're an Indigenous person. Um, and I've spoken with many, many about how this often will um, manifest itself, but individuals will use sort of, I'll call it indigenous trauma, but the indi intergenerational forms of trauma that exist among indigenous peoples um, because of all of the racial violence that we've inflicted on indigenous peoples, they'll use that trauma as if it's their own, right? And they'll claim that trauma as something that is in their body and so it becomes extremely difficult when, in, when individuals who have no experience with that whatsoever, who are relying on ancestors in the 1600s for the most part, um, are using that trauma. It's almost, it's, it's virtually impossible to put a stop to those individuals, right? Because then you have to actually find it within you to challenge um, their claims, and that can be quite difficult when it comes to the, particularly the intimate forms of violence that they'll often um, um, appropriate. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the question. So should I continue? Okay, great. Um, and so like I said, this is the first time um, that I'm kind of trying to bring in these two different elements on my research. It's not going to be the French language um, sort of images in this part, and I'm sorry for that, but because it's, it's really quite new. It's not something that's um, in, uh, it's in my book. And so one thing that has emerged since I published my book in 2019 is, um, and this was you know, somewhat clear to me prior to this, but is that genealogy obviously isn't the only part of the story. Um, and so there are individuals who make these claims who have never even, you know, thought about their family tree and or done genealogical research. They're doing it largely on the basis of a family story, a story that sort of pops up at some point in their past or that they're told by someone in their family that um, kind of propels them to make a particular claim. They never um, sort of uh, bother to verify it. Um, and, and so they're kind of just out there making these claims based on a story. And so what I've, what I've turned to recently, and this is, it's meant to be complementary to the genealogical component. It's not like they're separate. They often work together. Um, <clears throat> Um, but there's a way in which uh, what I'm calling family lore uh, is, is an important part of this sort of movement, if you will. Um, and so I've turned to literature written by uh, sociologists, particularly feminist sociologists, who are uh, have been really studying um, family history and the intimacies of family history. And so this one Brit this one sociologist, Carol Smart, um, she's British. She's been sort of looking at how secrets are kept in families, what types of secrets are kept, and what roles secret keeping plays in families. And so she demonstrates that the stories that cannot be regarded as simple factual accounts because in a way the stories that we tell family members about our families are, are still mediated um, by the sort of relationships in the broader society the personal cultural social relationships that exist that aren't just about our family um, and so smart 
through looking at um, this sort of particular um, set of Cette data that goes back to the Second World uh, War and sort of records family histories in Britain, qui se um, has argued that uh, family members deliberately received and fabricate events in chrono chronologically, alors, uh, uh, sorry, chronologies, in a manner gens, that shields the family uh, from public speaking or shame. And so you can imagine that it's something leur that's leur fairly common. Alors, you know, family uh, members, particularly because of those kinship bonds, don't Par want exemple, to necessarily expose de la famille, their dire, descendants uh, and or their other family members uh, to um, sort of conduct that might look bad on the family. And so instead of that, they might tell a story about who the family is or individuals were that, that in a way plays with the bon So it's not so much lying, it might be a deception, there might be fabrication, but it's something that, la, you know, in a way, bon sens, helps the family move um, into being more, uh, I guess you could say, Comment dire, uh, il cherche le mot. To be seen as upstanding. Il, and so there's another sociologist, uh, an Australian one here, Ashley Barnwell, um, comme who's, who's looked specifically at uh, an interview specifically family historians, especially those who do genealogical work, so genealogists in Australia, where you might know that there was um, sort of a, a, a real a lot of chronic shame for a long time. Mental, if you look into the past, famille, because there were a large proportion, a large proportion of the Australian settler population arrived in Australia as convicts, and there was a lot of shame familiaux. among certain families. Alors, and so people would hide the identities and or the stories related to family uh, members. And so she actually identified famille, different forms of what you could call uh, deeds, de, quote unquote, de, or um, de, uh, behavior that de led de people de to change stories about their family members. So criminality, sexual deviance, mental illness, petit, family uh, breakdown, uh, homosexuality, devient. and other social Alors, phenomena often carry profound stigma that led et, people et and families uh, to um, change the stories a and or, or deceive family members about who their grandfather or their great-grandfather or their great-grandmother. So in her, her words, families create, create adopt, and or perform particular, particular, particular practices in response to national pressures Alors, to censor and forget. So it's not just a matter of uh, people making enfin, individual decisions in a family, but it's also how those decisions play into the larger sort of national politique scope. And so I just wanted to kind of give this Uh, Alors, just kind of primer on the theoretical material or the theoretical work that's done on secret keeping and family uh, history and just to give you a sense of where I'm going here when I say family I'm not suggesting that people are lying or simply making up stories but that these stories that circulate in families often hide certain elements of the past and are deceived descendants of certain individuals to sort of uphold a vision of who the family is. Parce que ils veulent pas so nécessairement dire qui est la, um, la famille. Uh, Alors les familles créent et adoptent et mettent en œuvre des pratiques particulières en réponse um, à la situation nationale et les expériences individuelles. Et donc le premier qui a donné une mauvaise image de la famille. Donc vous voyez ici uh, le nom and, um, que vous avez peut-être entendu sort of déjà, c'est Jeff Boyden, qui a évoqué et qui a dit être The more recent, uh, most recent one is the Antonin who was the president of the Moldovan University of Newfoundland, who was the founder of the Anthropologist and I forget which university, the University of California, who was going to be uh, Mohawk, um, and etc. So these are all fairly well-known cases that appeared in the public sphere. One thing that happened in the public sphere is when a new story runs, is that individuals who are related to the family of the Moldovan University of Newfoundland, runs, is that individuals who are related to the family of the Moldovan University Where they Lorsque will des gens qui font ces revendications vont of, faire une déclaration, um, ils vont so dire comment ils s'entendent leur euh, identité. Um, and Alors, so, uh, je ne veux pas vous parler de tous ces personnes-là, mais je veux surtout mais So later in January 2017, this is at a time when Joseph Boyden was being celebrated in the country as the voice of indigenous people, the voice of the voice of this generation of indigenous writers, um, his books are being adopted in by schools boards across the country. So there's a lot of stories that are being told about his family, 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 about
Alors, il prétend d'être quelqu'un de très important et finalement, son histoire n'est pas réelle. Et alors, cette histoire-là, euh, qu'il raconte, a été véhiculée. Alors, qu'est-ce que vous savez ici, c'est Boyden euh, il y a une déclaration publiée par Herrera et il a et ça, Sissian est un site qui a publié son, son cas et donc comme il l'a publié c'est donc qu'il a eu un récit épargné bien et ce que j'aimerais vous dire, c'est que dans cette histoire bien ficelée, il y a quand même des questions, des, 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 des affirmations qui ne tiennent pas alors, voici ce qu'il a dit. Alors, il dit que l'héritage de ma famille est ancré dans nos histoires. Je les ai écoutées lorsque j'étais enfant. Mes sœurs aînées m'ont raconté que mon père d'apparence blanche aidait mon frère d'apparence autochtone à cacher leur sang pour se poursuivre leur devue à mon père. L'histoire de la famille de ma mère n'est certainement pas présentée de manière claire dans les documents officiels. Dès l'âge de ma c'est que j'appelais grand-mère, m'a raconté des histoires sur ma mère que j'ai jusqu'à maintenant appelée ma mère, que ma mère préférait garder pour elle, malgré le fait que les événements sont et douloureux, ma mère a dû revisiter des aspects de son passé qui croyaient à jamais intérêt. Donc, on va pas aller plus loin, mais on va aller à son nom, un oncle qu'il avait nommé oncle. Alors, tout ça a été publié, so what, donc, um, qu'est-ce qu'on voit C'est que c'est monsieur... A été nommé Uncle qui vendait des souvenirs authentiques. Earl Bowden s'est dit avoir l'esprit indien. Enfin, qu'est-ce qui est arrivé C'est qu'on voit l'histoire d'un maquet qui racontait c'est que quand il était jeune, enivré par les tintins, les cris de guerre et les bonnets de guerre suspendus, le petit Earl tombe immédiatement amoureux sous le champ des Indiens. Il s'est mis à découper des images d'Indiens, à improviser les costumes d'Indiens, à collectionner des souvenirs indiens. Sa chambre était là dans une vieille maison de Boyden, dans l'avenue Mackenzie, à l'ombre des bâtiments du Parlement est devenu une collection d'actes et de flèches de peau de dents. Alors, tout ça, il nous parle de tout ce qu'il a fait en tant qu'Indian Joe. Tout d'abord, il a eu une boutique dans une des avenues les plus importantes de sa ville, dans le sud de l'Ontario. Alors, à ce moment-là, il y avait beaucoup de touristes européens, américains, et qui venaient. Alors, donc, il se met à vendre des souvenirs de l'artisanat, disons, autochtone, entre guillemets, aux touristes. Alors, nous avons ici une... Une carte postale de ce Uncle Earl. On voit que on a mis une affiche qui est en train de tomber, mais on voit le John Joe avec son allure d'Indien, génuine, habillé en peau de dames et un tipi. Alors voilà, et c'est là qu'il a son commerce. Alors vous voyez ici un enfant qui adopte une, une posture euh, assis, euh, style indien. Alors tout ça, euh, même on commence à vendre toutes ces cartes postales en ligne. Alors je vais continuer avec l'histoire. 
Alors, je vais raconter l'histoire. Euh, on a ici l'histoire dont je viens de parler. Joseph Boyden's quote unquote Indian looking uncle. Excited by Tom Toms and war cries and trailing war bonnets, little Earl fell in love with the Indian on the spot. He took the cutting up pictures of Indians, improvising Indian costumes, collecting Indian souvenirs. His bedroom in the old Boyden home was in the end of the Parliament building and a litter of bows and arrows and oxen. His most treasured possession was a five-foot-tops and an advert that was done on the euh, sont bien les plus précieux d'un tipi de coton. Le dernier euh, des Mohicans était son livre préféré et lui et, euh, et ses frères économisaient leurs pièces de monnaie pour aller voir Brockovilly Anderson le samedi après-midi au cinéma du quartier et Coster's Last Stand, un spectacle de théâtre présenté au Grand Opera House de Toronto en 2007. Les colonnes, le jeune homme. Et ça passait d'ailleurs. Um, um, il se voyait comme un garçon up, blanc um, grâce so, à ses connaissances en matière de chasse, d'activité traditionnelle, so au a, grand a terre. Il a adopté donc uh, cette allure um, de chef indien et reçoit une place de la, de la tribu. Boyden's uh, family would consider him quote unquote Indian looking because he appears to perform a particular identity, right? He appears to be indigenous from on the way that he dresses, typically, and the fact that he has this um, particular trading post. Um, and so calling him Indian looking isn't exactly uh, wrong, it's not exactly a lie, um, but um, anyone could, could appear that way if they perform that identity donc, euh, revendiquer cette identité, et so really, um, um, les gens qui ne savent pas plus, est arrivé à l'oncle de Joseph Boyden, qui était très malheureux, et qui vient de tuer un touriste, c'est un américain qui a visité son poste de traite, et il voulait prendre une photo. Ils avaient un appareil photo, ils voulaient prendre une 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 photo, ils voulaient prendre Of this unbelievable, Donc, euh, il voulait avoir du film, euh, il voulait tourner who's, who's cet, cet événement, and so, um, cet, cet Indien his, um, qui uh, uh, était un attirail uh, indien, et donc il est allé gets, chercher oh, it's a rifle. Un, so he gets his rifle out of his, 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 um, his son fusil, TV, where he runs his business, and not knowing that it's loaded, he et actually accidentally uh, shoots one of the tourists. Il l'a tué, l'un des touristes, uh, par accident. Parce qu'il ne savait um, pas so that's a quite a euh, tragic que thing, right? le, um, not only le, le fusil someone, était but chargé. C'était très tragique et c'était devenu donc um, une, so une, goes, une, um, une, une, court. He's, une affaire uh, prématiatisée. Il a été so coupé non coupable, prison, mais il n'a pas dû faire la prison, mais on voit que plus tard, il s'est suicidé. This happens before Après. Joseph Boyden is born, so he ça, never actually avant, meets his uncle. Ça c'est avant la naissance de Joseph um, Boyden. Il n'a jamais rencontré. Uh, not in person, but if we were if we were to take the work on family secret keeping and family Mais history and how that sort of operates, you can imagine that as a young child, um, Joseph would have been fonctionne. probably protected by family members from non Joseph était right? probablement protégé par um, ses proches. How his life came to an end. Um, uh, il ne savait pas la vérité sur. Um, instead of telling that story, uh, one would tell the fantastical story about how he attracted so many tourists tragique, and how stories were written about him in the National Magazine. Uh, and so that sort of type of story becomes this family lore um, that uh, propels. Et uh, young Joseph and other members of his family to imagine themselves as indigenous. One thing that becomes clear later on in this chapter familiale. that he wrote that I, I'm not going to get into quite as much today um, is that uh, so, uh, there's an interview with his mother, so this would be the other side of his family. Il y a eu une entrevue avec sa famille, um, uncle, avec sa mère, l'autre côté de sa famille. And they both talk Donc, about how uh, it's Joseph himself who starts to claim it. Et les deux disent que c'était Joseph qui commençait à revendiquer no le statut, le, that, le identité, right? And so Joseph interprets Joseph. the fact personne that his uncle personne has this identity, and now the story becomes Et not just that Joseph, he sells trinkets uh, to tourists, but that he had lots and lots of indigenous friends. 
and that indigenous people worked for him and, and produced the material for him, although that is still questionable. And so one can imagine that sort of um, repurposing um, that life to give it some meaning becomes important for people today. Uh, becomes a way to um, reclaim a particular proud uh, history cette vie, cette of having a relationship with the Native Indigenous histoire, uh, fière um, de relation so avec les I just want to kind of leave us on that. Uh, this is work that I'm kind of, you know, stitching together, uh, 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 trying, to, trying to think through, so I'm more than happy uh, to take some, uh, some feedback on it. But what I'm trying to get at here is that the stories that we hear uh, in our families, whether they're coming from uh, our grandparents or they're coming from our aunt or our uncle or whatever the case may be, or whether they're coming from, in this case, someone like Joseph Boyd and he's telling them to his mother and father and uncle, look, I found that we're actually indigenous. Um, these stories are not simply truthful. They need to be unpacked. Living in a, a particular settler colonial context where the elimination of indigenous peoples is sort of um, oftentimes what propels our stories about who we are forward, we need to understand and try as best as we can to verify the types of stories that circulate in our families and not take them as truths. And so many of the people, if we, uh, many of the people I, I mentioned earlier in the show, in that sort of timeline, they're simply reiterating stories that they may have heard at one point in their family and or creating those stories themselves to match what they have heard circulating in their family. And um, they, they never bothered to verify it. And I think we need to move beyond self-identification um, and sort of the, just sort of simply believing these stories to one where um, we're respecting indigenous sovereignty and self-determination in the ways that we need to be in the context where Voici quelques articles que j'ai écrits en français. Si vous voulez en lire en français, je vais laisser ça avec les organisateurs et organisatrices. Ça, c'est la traduction de mon livre en français, Ascendance détournée quand les Blancs revendiquent une identité autochtone, qui a été publié en 2022, en prise de parole à Sudbury. Et, um, I've already sort of um, talked a bit about my book here. Oops, and there's um, some other livre, articles that I've written. Et voilà donc d'autres articles que j'ai écrits. And the basis of this movement, one of them in particular, is the sort of the literature that has emerged supporting this movement. So we'll call it history, and studies, and psychology, this chapter. Um, so there's uh, a few other things that I've published in here. More than happy to contact me um, for if you are earning a copy. Contactez ce sujet si vous ne pouvez pas obtenir une copie de ce livre. Ou de ces so articles. Et je, to be in touch. Voilà donc mes coordonnées. Um, je vais faire uh, de mon mieux pour vous fournir le nécessaire. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have, uh, we have time for a question or two? Sure. Okay. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. For sure. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Song Ran Kim, uh, who's wondering about whether or not First Nations um, have any identity authentication systems. Des systèmes d'authentification. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, the question is, is like, like, do First Nations groups have have a, a way to like basically validate somebody's indigenous ancestry or identity? Sorry. Well, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, Spring Water, but um, uh, it, it may be something that you might feel comfortable um, also kind of addressing. My understanding is that uh, most of, of that will revolve around uh, an understanding of kinship. Um, right, moi, and so who are you related to faut, tends to be cela, one of the major ways that particularly um, First Nations people, but also Inuit people, will uh, sort of donc, um, introduce themselves um, to uh, others, right? Uh, and so that's one way of having a conversation autres. about how you belong, une façon you know, de, introducing de, that idea de, of, de, de uh, do I know your grandmother, you know? Do I know exemple, your aunt? Um, and so when we talk about kinship 
um, relations and particularly the kinship obligations as sort of central to indigenous identities, I think that's really what we're getting at, right? Um, and so just to kind of come back to the question, I think it, it was asking for something maybe um, a little bit different, but I think that's how it kind of gets expressed in a colloquial term, a colloquial way. Now, of course, there are people who have been disconnected because of the US, because of the 60s scoop, because of all of these policies and laws that Canadian society has, has um, sort of put in place that really have been about breaking up Indigenous families. And so um, I want to be clear that my research is much more about, is only really about people who are making long ago claims. And those people who are, who are trying to reconnect through um, you know, reasserting their kinship relations and you know, obligations, um, they do so in all kinds of different ways. What I've seen just in terms of the, the conversations I've had with First Nations people in particular is that there's a very, um, there's a general openness to accepting those people from the community and wanting to find those people, you know, wanting to know where they were, where they ended up, because they're still members of the community and they were, they were taken away at some point um, and people still remember them and still want them to come home. Um, and so, uh, you know, when it comes to sort of formal mechanisms, well, there are different approaches you know, uh, across, sort of, um, across what we call Canada today. Uh, the Mi'kmaq, for instance, in Nova Scotia, they put in place something. Uh, they're, they're in sort of um, in negotiations. They have been for quite a long time when it comes to sort of putting into practice, I guess you can say, the treaties they signed in the 1700s. Uh, and so they've come up with their own sort of citizenship model. And that revolves around um, being able to connect um, ancestrally or genealogically with uh, a Mi'kmaq family who they've identified, there are many of them. Um, going um, back to like the, uh, the mid 1800s, uh, uh, the 1860s. In, in and so they're family, saying they're recognizing that people uh, have been and were disconnected from the United for instance. Que, um, bien, bien and bien they bien are bien accepting bien those people bien for the most part as Mi'kmaq. Right? And so if bien you're bien going back to the 1600s, it's a different story. Those people tend to be Acadians today. Um, if they do have ancestry uh, and only si ancestry in the And so the Mi'kmaq have decided ça, not to necessarily not put status as central to how they're defining who they uh, are. And that's really what you see First Nations doing across the country, <clears throat> is taking sort of control of um, their sort of citizenship, uh, Canada, if you will, general, uh, away from the federal uh, government. So it's not just status that comes to the first nations, but it's other sort of things. De sorte que ce ne soit plus que le statut Thank you. Um, like one of the one of the things that I know, like when we think about a lot of the uh, race shifters, you know, they've gained gained a lot of traction. You know, in terms of being able to access grants and bursaries that are specifically for you know Indigenous folks, and you know, there some of them are even. Um, Et, um, you know, gaining employment opportunities on you know the claim to their quote unquote Mé Métis identity. Um, and, and now, in terms of you know the um, you know I put this in quotations to the Eastern Métis. Uh, is anyone taking them seriously other than themselves? Yeah, the gens qui prennent ces gens au sérieux à part eux-mêmes. Yeah, um, les Métis well, de l'Est. It would appear not, except again, it's really about non, the way in which. Um, these individuals have been able to infiltrate um, public Ces institutions. In that's the, that's the main fact. I mean, if it wasn't for that, then you can imagine, Mais like, de cela. you know, there would be some concern about that possibility and all that, but, but um, inquietude there's a very large proportion of individuals Mais claiming they're indigenous in public institutions. You know, and I, I don't have a figure on how many would depend on which type of public institution. Um, but we're, we're talking about thousands across the country. On parle de right? And so Canada. that in and of itself is quite harmful to indigenous people. Ça, um, ça fait just, just the fact that you have essentially white people taking up these positions. Now imagine if thousands of indigenous people had those positions. What kind of impact that would have de, de on the everyday life of those individuals and their families? And their just on that level. 
Besides the fact that these positions are often um, positions where those individuals represent indigenous people, right? it's not just about having a job, but it's about actually being the voice of indigenous people. people. And so those individuals will often um, promote ideas of what it means to be indigenous. That are extremely problematic. De um, and even they're if they're, they're not problematic, they're not indigenous. Right? Even if they're literally copy and pasting what they read in the book written by an indigenous person, it's not for them to do that. It's for them to give up those uh, that position. Ce n'est pas à eux de le faire. Um, Steve was wondering um, if you could speak demande. to Métis citizenship as a mode si of validating Métis claims. Yeah, so I mean, the, the Métis nation itself does have uh, its own sort of like uh, revendication to protocols. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> essentially what one needs to do is to, Donc, to demonstrate a connection to uh, someone who uh, was Métis in the past. And Métis, by Métis, they don't mean mixed race. Passé. That's a common misconception in Canadian society. What makes the Métis an Indigenous people isn't that they're mixed. Um, with First Nations, it's that they had a particular sort of political and social and sort of economic role um, and relationships with First Nations people on the, on the sort of plains and the prairies. And so uh, we can go back to, I think it was about the early 1820s, if I'm not mistaken, there was a uh, sort of a diplomatic alliance that was signed between the Assiniboine, the Plains Cree, the Soto, who are the sort of Anishinaabe out uh, west of the Great Lakes, and the Métis. Um, and that political alliance was called the Iron Alliance. And that was the recognition by the Métis First Nation kin that they were indigenous, that they were indigenous collectivity, um, not unlike the Plains Cree and, and the Assiniboine and, and, the, and the Soto. Many indigenous people, First Nations, are mixed on some level, Right? On some façon, level, there's que, you know, uh, not always by choice. Right? Des, uh, we're talking about the sort of impacts of colonialism. And so it's not entre, the mixedness of the nation that Donc makes them pas le fait It's the relationships that they have continued to maintain as sang, indigenous people uh, for the first And when you go out west, the first few times that I was out there, I was si surprised. You know, at what, moi, quand je suis allée dans l'Ouest, j'étais même très surpris. And the sort of conversations that we had about what it meant to be. Being from out here, you know, uh, I had read about it, I spoken with some friends about it, some colleagues. But then when I go and present my work out there, it's a completely different situation. Where being made team pour, pour mon travail, mais lorsque je suis allé dans leur communauté, c'était une Métis réalité tout à fait notre really parce que beaucoup de Métis ont vraiment euh, des Métis qui sont gardés le rapport avec les Premières Nations for well over et c'est and so, um, yes, the Métis Nation, um, through their different affiliates, do have their own citizenship protocols, and, and I respect those protocols. I'm not in any way challenging them, and um, that's why I often work with Métis governments, because um, my research is, is, is about completely different groups. Parce que ma recherche se centre sur Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in terms of, Merci. Um, Je me demande, like, do you have any thoughts or uh, you know ideas on how white vous folks, vous in particular, and you know, institutions like propos, the United Church of Canada, can disrupt the problem uh, of race shifting? Well, I mean, one of the things that um, comes up a lot when I'm, you know, when I'm presenting this work and in conversation with different folks that folks is, is that question, right? So how do, how do we come up with a strategy? And so what you see a lot of First Nations doing in particular is coming up with those sort of citizenship protocols, right? And so that's one way to be like, well, we do know that there are people out there who uh, might be non-status and, and are trying to reconnect uh, and have to sort of facilitate that and claim the in a way statue, where those people uh, aren't going to start claiming a completely different identity and then really harm you know, the first nation sort of, pas droit, uh, mais qui and, et, and et Alors, il y a, um, So uh, usually when it comes to institutions, what my experience uh, is that a lot of institutions right now are trying to deal with this, trying to come up with ways to sort of address these concerns and you know, that starts with a lot of institutions having these types of conversations, 
and really listening to um, the, the sort of First Nations and Inuit or Métis people who are connected to particular sort of communities uh, and are recognized as such exemple, by their communities um, on what needs to be done. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly how things work with the United Church or what types of, uh, sort of situations you may find yourself in, but it could be the partnerships, or etc. I would, you know, suggest that you have a strong body of, of Indigenous people who um, are uh, sort of empowered to make decisions about who you enter into partnerships with, uh, si vous savez you know, who you um, hire for Indigenous positions, and uh, how you develop Indigenous vous, initiatives with actual Indigenous si peoples, and etc. Et, and, you know, like, and, and as much as this might seem obvious, si you know, I just found out that the, 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 the Ontario Ministry of Education que, just hired uh, um, a fake Métis yeah, person aussi, as their lead uh, on French language indigenous initiatives. Uh, in il y a uh, des situations, for all par exemple, sort of, comme Fran uh, uh, Catholic and, and uh, in public Ontario, in the French language. And she, what, what does she do in this position? She invites other people like Frances, her to speak si for indigenous people, right? Uh, and so, de, as much as there's progress made in some, métis, some cases, if you don't have Um, alors, something in place to prepare for alors, these types si of situations, what's going to happen is you end up sitting across the table from someone who is going to tell you a story uh, that is going to be very compelling uh, about what makes them indigenous. Right? If nothing else, what I found out is that people who are making these claims, white people who are making these claims, are extremely, extremely well-versed. They understand anti-colonial, decolonial politics, they understand the politics of reconciliation, and they're able to forward arguments that will um, you know, often bring people who, are, again, are maybe very well-meaning um, on board with their fraud. Mais il faut aller and so you need people who are able to sit recherches. through this. And if it's not, it, obviously you need people. And then you also need you know, some sort of approach that you can apply in a very different situation. Well, thank you so much, Daryl. Um, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. I was so super excited um, to have you coming tonight. Thank you. Um, yes. And um, yeah, just thank you so much. And I really, really encourage everyone to... Um, et je demande Purchase vraiment, uh, j'invite à tout le monde um, à lire le know, livre de Daryl. Informez-vous à propos de ce sujet. Je sais que maintenant on va voir un petit thank moment so much, les participants et on remercie Daryl. Thank you, Sweetwater. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you so Merci much for this time of engagement. We are wrapping up um, this, this time. And so uh, just noting that in the chat, um, there's a link in case you want to explore more about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. The written reflections, this recording will be posted online as well. Uh, next week, if you would like to join us online, um, we'll be exploring anti-racist and decolonial theologies. Uh, that will be in English only. Um, anyone is welcome to attend. And the very last, we will keep gathering on Tuesday evenings, and the very last session on November 28th will be bilingual one. Again, that, will, that last one will focus on uh, the next thing. So we're thankful that you were here this evening. And again, as you leave, there will be a short exit survey if you're, if you're able to respond to those questions. That will be very helpful for us all. And thank you once again to Daryl and Sprintwater. Thank you to everyone for being here, uh, and blessings on your day. Et merci Thank you. Springwater et on bénit euh, votre journée.